Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Right now, we're going to get started in about three minutes, um, but just settle in. If you haven't gotten yourself a snack, please go ahead and do so, a drink, um, and you'll be able to enjoy a conversation here in a few minutes. can still talk they won't care <laughs> i think at the moment we are still alone right yeah it doesn't look like there's anyone else yeah i'm no. not seeing anybody right now do you have to let them come in shouldn't have to and i don't see anybody sitting in a waiting room or anything uh, you're recording right mm -hmm. Is the Goethe Institute joining? You know, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if, a, if a representative from the Goethe Institute is joining us or not. I thought it was interesting that um, Begum lives in Berlin, but she, but Geta is not a thing there. It is definitely an American German thing, which I guess I kind of thought it would have come from something German, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was researching a little bit on it, and I think there are variations to it, mm. uh, not with oat, but with buckwheat mm. inside um, in certain parts. It, yeah. Apparently it was inspired by it, but yeah. I, I think sausages are interesting in general. <laughs> um, it's, it's to me, sausage is an odd thing. I haven't, I, I do eat poultry and fish now, but for a long time <laughs> I was a vegetarian and I just the idea of sausage kind of grossed me out. <laughs> so. <laughs> I share that sentiment. <laughs> I've come around to it. I have, I have, as well. I have, I've eaten the turkey and the vegan gata, and they're not bad. That's, but it's not something I want, you know? Mm -hmm. But my but my partner loves gata, like loves oh. it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's definitely, I think, um, a personal taste. This um, vegan getta is made out of cremini mushrooms and oats. So mm. I'm excited to, to try this. So. Ah, of course, there might be really nice uh, variations yeah. to it. I like it really, really crispy. Like, I think for me, it's a texture thing. So it has to get super crunchy for me, you know? And I did like the taste of the vegan getta more than the turkey, actually. It just had more flavor. So, something to think about anything <laughs> fry is going to be tasty so That's true <laughs> <laughs> the more fat the better <laughs> so it looks like we are starting to get um a crowd going. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give us an introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on our second day of this time tomorrow and our second Geta Institute. Um, you've heard us just chatting about Geta. Um, for those of you who don't know what Geta is, it is um, a German inspired sausage that Cincinnati is really well known for, or breakfast meat, or, you know, I've, I've heard it described as a lot of things, but um, made up of a as wonderful assembly of meats. Um, personally, I haven't had red meat since I was a teenager, but I've tried the turkey and vegan versions. They're not too bad. Um, I would love to start us off today by having Begum and Emily talk to us about their take on Geta today. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into uh, some of our thanks and introductions. Begum, would you like to start? Yes. Yes, sure. Um, so 
I was not able to make the getter myself as you had to start cooking it already the day before and that I think one has to be really passionate about it already in order to start the day before. But instead, I um, I got um, something else that is very German and has a similar shape, uh, which is like German bread. Can I show it? Is it uh, absolutely yeah. visible? Do you see it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is my take on it for today. Can you tell us like what is in the bread that makes it so hearty looking? Um, I think there's no yeast inside actually. So it's only grains and not um, like uh, seeds, um, which makes it very square <laughs> uh, and very intense. It is. I've had it, we were talking earlier and it, it really fills you up. Like one slice is good to go until lunchtime. It's really good. Emily, how about you? Well, I actually have a, um, a getta sandwich and a little salad from uh, Sleepy Bee. And um, I too, I, I don't eat pork. So um, this is a vegan option. Um, and it's supposedly made, as I was saying earlier, with cremini mushrooms um, and the oats. So I'm, I'm excited to dig into it. Yes, there is a getta for everyone. I encourage you all to try. And we were saying earlier, it's best crispy. So the more fat, the better. So just, just so you all know, some good prep tips. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us um, for our second Geta Institute. Um, I'm really excited to hear this conversation uh, and ex excited to see Begum's uh, show, Letters from Attica. Um, I'm just going to thank really quickly our sponsors, the Carol Ann and Ralphie Hale Junior Foundation and then some additional sponsors for TTT. Without your help, we wouldn't be able to do great programming such as this. So thank you so much for supporting us and supporting our artists. So I'd love to introduce Emily and Begum now. Emily Hanako Momahara is a lens-based artist and activist. Her work centers around issues of heritage, multiculturalism, immigration, and social justice. Mamahara is an associate professor of studio art at the Art Academy of Cincinnati and is a new member of the CAC Board of Trustees. Welcome, Emily. Begum Erchias is born in Turkey. She first studied molecular, <clears throat> sorry, molecular biology and genetics and later dance and choreography. In the last years, uh, in the most recent years, her work has become increasingly transdisciplinary and has revolved around the audience's own voice activated in intimate settings. She is currently based in Brussels and Berlin. Welcome, Begum. So just so you all know kind of how this is going to work, I am now gonna turn off my video and audio and pop back in about 15 minutes before one to field your questions. I would love it for you to put questions into the Q&A or in the chat or just talk to each other or make comments in the chat as a way to engage. And I'll bring those up um, a little later on in the hour. So thank you everyone. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, thank you so much, Tony. Um, so um, I had the the privilege uh, to talk to Begum this weekend about uh, the performances that are happening with uh, this time tomorrow, um, this week. And then yesterday I was actually able to be part of the performance. Um, and these performances are really interesting because they're, they are participatory. So it, it, you don't go and, and, and watch the performance itself. Um, and so uh, we, we discussed some questions and topics that we're going to talk to you all about and are really excited to hear what questions you might have as well. Um, so uh, I guess we can just start out here. So this is Letters from Attica, um, which is what the first thing that, that strikes me about this work is that it has this embedded desire for community in it. Um, and when I was participating in the performance yesterday, even the language that was used from these letters really talks about community and the longing for community. 
Um, um, and for those of you who are not as familiar with the project, participants um, are, are spread out to socially distance, but are literally passing a message from person to person, kind of creating a chain of information, um, similar to that game you played when you were a kid, right, of telephone. Um, so Begum, I, I guess let's let's just start out. What are what were your ins inspirations for this kind of solidarity uh, creation and bringing everyone together for this performance? Um, yes, um, I mean, I, I was the piece was originally a commission by a festival in Brussels uh, to create uh, something that could work with the current measures. Um, current measures being the um, uh, summer 2020, so quite soon um, in, the say, in the first lockdown when the idea of lockdown was still somehow fresh. Um, and to, that it would content-wise in some way reflect to the situation, to the moment we are in. Um, and it was a moment where we were really um, cut off from each other, um, socially, um, also professionally. We, we could not, um, it was forbidden together. Um, there was, yeah, we were hearing each other through these um, digital media that also somehow transform. I don't know, there are a lot of bugs. You don't really hear each other or each, hear each other's voice actually. Um, and also there were many things happening in that moment, like um, um, there was a lot of censorship in some way. Um, what happened is that um, in Brussels, there was a, a boy that was running away from police control uh, that died. Um, so there was a lot of protest and as there was no protest possible, uh, people were putting banners on their windows uh, saying justice for a deal. Uh, but even they were taken down by the police at that time um, because it was not safe to put banners on your window. I mean, that was the excuse. Um, so it was really this moment where it was uh, all means of communication, interpersonal communication felt cut. Um, so, yeah, there soon I was um, quite decided to work in a format that would be about passing on a message from person to person. Um, and um, it was the moment uh, that I ran over that I found out about Samerville and his letters. Um, and I was very inspired by it because these letters were written from a similar sense of isolation and uh, separation. Um, and the desire for uh, togetherness was very strong content wise. Um, and as I read the letters, I also saw that uh, how the letters change in mood from being more about isolation and the sense of loneliness um, developing more and more into a sense of um, collective determination, a political determination. Uh, and this is exactly also what I was observing in my surroundings that on one hand, people were um, affected by the sudden sense of isolation. And yet there was a strong sense of, ah, we have to do something, we have to change something, this is the moment. If you want to change something, this is the moment. Wow, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much there. Let me, let me ask a few questions on there. I yeah. asked, it, one thing I found interesting, um, I, I researched the police killing of a deal uh, mm. and I saw that it was on Easter weekend. So it's almost exactly, mm. A year from that, yeah, um, which is kind of a poignant uh, moment for us to yeah. be doing this performance um, again. Yeah, just to clarify, also the uh, dying of a deal triggered a lot of uh, discussions on, um, uh, missing the words now, um, on 
how people are treated differently please like um that like yeah white people are not stopped by the police other people are stopped by the police and um soon after black lives matter um, protests started also coming from the us and also uh, taking over um, appearing also in brussels on the streets these uh, protests so yeah that um that really kind of leads into the next question I had, yeah. which um, kind of about that that yeah. that um, grassroots, right? Um, yeah. That you talk about grassroots. Um, that there are um, a lot. That there's personal interaction in this with everyone who goes to the performance. You're not just watching it, um, and each person has interaction with at least two other people, right? One person that's giving them a message, and one person that they're passing a message onto. Um, and that they're sharing that letter with. Um, so there's this micro and macro function, right? Mm -hmm. so there's the whole, and then there's the individual that mm -hmm. kind of comes back and forth um, dealing with these, these kind of social issues. Um, so the folks in the performance are not audience members, they're actually participating. Um, and can you talk about um, what about those personal interactions was important mm -hmm. to you? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, one thing about the format is that, of course, despite uh, containing a certain longing for community, um, everybody is still in a place of um, uh, solid, put in a place of solitude because uh, you're alone. I mean, it is not a communication. You're alone and you're just receiving. You're alone. You're passing on. Um, so you're alone in both of these positions um, and also you are listening and i mean uh, what's really important for me about the in the piece is not only the content of the letters um, but also the voice as such um because as you're alone standing between two people you're always listening to the voice of one person uh you're listening to the uniqueness of that voice the materiality of that voice how um the physicality of that voice and how you can imagine how it must be to stand anywhere else in the line that it must be just very different from the experience that you are having uh, and it's the same with the person receiving your words. Uh, you see the, you know, also as a listener, you see the difference how the person receives um, the, the object, let's say the voice that you're passing on. Um, so yes, in this participation, of course, there was the sense of intimacy that I still wanted to keep the sense of solitude among all this um and also an emphasis uh, not only on the content of uh, communication uh, but also on the voice as such that was so um impactful in the performance itself mm -hmm. um you know there were moments where when you were when you were writing um the letters or crafting the letters that we would uh, pass on the the cadence of the words um and and i think i mentioned to you earlier that there are moments where you say where you have to say honk honk or mm -hmm. boom boom and it almost created this kind of lyrical quality that was then going passing down through the line of folks um that was really beautiful um and so as a performance artist that that kind of interaction um and the materials the placement of the participants um like uh it in the cincinnati version and i don't know if it was this way when you first did it in brussels but there was there's a window um in the structure that there are people in as well so you're really passing information all around right um can you talk about how you how you choreograph that or how as a performance artist you have to think about these different pieces of the puzzle that go together um yeah i mean it was also a process of uh, trying and figuring it out 
Um, I think at some point we came to the point of uh, having to make a decision. Is it a game or is it a fiction in some way? So um, at some point I thought, okay, we are on one side of the street and we change, people change, so they can change a little bit. Uh, the order, they can have a different perspective on it. Um, but then at some point, we uh, very late in the process, actually, we decided to um, put more emphasis on the sense of um, complicity, uh, secrecy, the, the fiction as if the message would be coming from Sam, and as if it would be the letter would be really passed on to a certain recipient. So I think it was an important moment in the process to decide that the line should go just straight, but it should go rather a bit zigzag. So you don't have the overview of the line. You know that it's coming from somewhere and you're go it's going somewhere. But as you don't see the, the ends, um, you can, uh, yeah, it's your role to actually imagine where it's coming from and where it's going. Um, so, um, yeah, and then with the text, of course, um, we made a lot of choices in terms of uh, the text is like recomposition from the letter. So it's like little pieces from different letters put together. Um, and the choice there was about um, finding material that both relates to the uh, place and the history and the time when Sam wrote it and to his experience and also could potentially relate to our experience here and now um, in this moment of history. And at the same time, it was also about finding the segments that make sense that made sense for him probably to write in the form of a letter and at the same time makes sense for us to speak out loud orally now addressing one another. Yes, and I encourage everyone to sign up uh, for this because you really, you know, it's, it's kind of abstract to hear <laughs> talking about it, but when you're in the in the moment, um, it's really powerful. Um, you know, there was a time when even each word was being passed. So you'd say each word from the sentence and have to pass it on before you could hear the next word. And so there was just this real physicality in in the um, in the participation. Um, and then. Um, yeah, we'll get into the letters themselves here. Yeah, let's get into the letters themselves. Let, let's talk about, oh, did you want to add something to that? No, I mean, this is a little bit what I mean with the, uh, somehow with this, using the letter somehow as a tool to create a situation along the line, you know, like this fast part or a certain dynamic, a certain rhythm. Uh, yeah, that was just to speak about the process, yes. Yeah, yeah, rhythm definitely. I, I felt that when I was when I was participating. Um, so let's let's talk about Sam Melville. So if you are not familiar with Sam uh, or with Melville, uh, in 1969 he detonated eight bombs in different corporate and government buildings to protest the Vietnam War. He pled guilty and was sentenced uh, to uh, incarceration at Attica. So that's where these letters from Attica comes. And so uh, to Begum, like you collage these pieces of his letters to other people together um, so beautifully. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how did you find his letters and, and what drew you to, to kind of work with them as material? Um, yeah, at some point um, with, the, with the format of passing on one to another, uh, the idea of letters came very quickly uh, as they are written to one person only. Uh, and uh, the idea that it will be letters written in prison also came very quickly because I stumbled over Sam Melville and the language was beautiful. Uh, it was very uh, easygoing, casual, yet very um, uh, also very literary in some way, not 
only casual. Um, and many segments in his letters, um, I could really relate this idea of uh, walking without having no keys and no money in your pockets. Um, I remember this very strongly from the first lockdown where I went out and I had no, you know, it was not for, for nothing. I mean, there was no, uh, nothing I, I could have bought or done. It was just like going, taking a little stroll, coming back. Um, um i was still looking um if we would um widen the frame to also other letters written in prison uh of course of which there are many um but um quickly i can like it started with by finding sam's letters wanting to expand on that but then actually coming back to sam's letters uh, and sticking to them. So, yeah, it's so interesting. So, I mean, um, there's his, his, the words and the way that you've put them together really underlines the complexity of, of who he was and the social and political elements. Um, this idea of being a political prisoner, um, but then also juxtaposing that with this kind of child's game, right? And um, I think it's it's so beautiful. Um, do you consider him? Well, I guess this wasn't a question I was at. I, I have put on here, but do you consider him to be a, a collaborator? You know, you've collaborated a lot. Um, you collaborated in the work like the actual writing of it um, and then uh, there's like five different people that are collaborators and the participants are collaborators um, like how do you see that role of collaboration and, and also like Melville's role in that too yeah for sure I mean I work always with people I think this is something that you do when you come from a practice uh, when you work in theater uh, that you are very used to never working alone, uh, always work, having uh, other specialists, but also just people trying things out for you, um, that you work in a, a collective way. I think this is very specific to um, theatrical practice. Um, and so, of course, it is uh, also special then to work with uh, texts of somebody who Who, who's not there, <laughs> who's not there. And um, still you feel very, because I know almost all the letters by heart, so you feel like he's such a specific person. So with the collaborators, we also had many discussions of uh, what did he mean? Did he mean this or did he mean that? And uh, how his mo mood changed throughout the letters. For me, it was very obvious, others told, that was that, yeah, it was differently. So of course you also speculate, there's a lot of speculation. Um, and then of course, um, in some way you want to stay also true to certain qualities um, in his writing. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, you want to also make it relevant for the people who speak the text because they literally speak it. It's, they don't just read it somewhere. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of um, negotiation. Uh, at some point you, uh, you asked me actually in the discussion before um, if you would have been happy uh, to see the outcome of this. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Still, <laughs> yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, uh, of course, I haven't read all the letters, but I feel like I got an understanding of who he was mm -hmm. from the selections that you made and the way that you piece them together. One thing that was really interesting is how different. So you have nine different letters. And some, like one was to his son and one is to his brother and, you know, to different people in his life. Um, 
And I wonder, I mean, I, I definitely saw the, the difference in the emotional quality, right? The, the mm -hmm. kind of the up and down of the, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the interaction? Cause I think about uh, the political unrest that we have right now, um, mm -hmm. think about COVID isolation. And I think that the different people in our lives, we definitely interact with differently, mm -hmm. just like Sam did in his letters. Can you tell the, tell the viewers a little bit about kind of that ebb and flow? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the, it is also interesting the letters that um, he mentions at many points that he can actually not write very much, uh, that he cannot write about the institution, as it said in the uh, piece. Uh, but this comes up several times, you know, he writes a whole letter and he says, but I can actually not write much now, I do, you know, uh, there is this um, you read a letter and you know what is actually what matters to him, a lot of it is left out. Um, and um, he was also aware that all the letters were read like three times until it, it um, arrived at the recipient and he was also aware that some of the letters never arrived at the recipient. Um, so there is a yeah, curation, <laughs> there is a selection in what is mentioned in the letters and what is not. So mostly it is, of course, the emotional connection and um, uh, his, his uh, personal experience of the situation uh, and very little about the actual situation in prison that you read in the letters. Um, Um, and generally, you feel that in the beginning it was he was quite depressed. Um, if I may say it, I think uh, he, it was very difficult to come after. Um, I mean, um, I was also reading the introduction of his girlfriend actually, where he where she says that he was quite a loner outside already. Uh, that he acted alone sometimes without checking with the others and. Um, uh, still, it seems like in the letters that it was very hard for him to be in prison in the first place, yet more and more he found a sense of togetherness um, with uh, the others, the uh, members of the Black Panthers, the Latinos, the, you know, the different camps and races that were divided in prison. Um, somehow they started reading together, rapping together. I don't know, this is what you read that uh, more and more there's a sense of togetherness. Um, and also one of his lawyers at the very end, um, uh, during the uprising, uh, he writes that Sam told him that he found a sense of togetherness here that he never had outside or that he always wanted but never managed to find outside. Um, so uh, this is a little bit the spirit. It goes from this um, depression into euphoria almost. Yeah, you know, there's so many like cyclical um, narratives that happen in this piece. Um, and one of them you just talked about where he finds connection mm. being in prison, right? Mm. Um, and how the connection that we're making as participants in your performance um, also actually became really, I feel like I, I know better now the, part, the two people that were sitting, that were on either side of me, mm -hmm. even though I don't really know them any better now, but we shared this thing mm -hmm. together, this mutual sharing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I see that kind of woven throughout the entire, throughout the entire performance. And, you know, we keep coming back to these themes of being alone, but also being together and connecting that, of course, to today's uh, social issues and uh, to COVID and the to alone together kind of life that we've, we're, that we're doing right now, right? Mm -hmm. On Zoom. Um, it's so interesting. Um, how about uh, the idea of actually bringing, and, and I know you've done this in some of your previous work, but that you actually have viewers of the work become uh, participants in the work. Um, so, so we are 
we are part of it with you. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's different than a lot of performance art. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, also in my um, previous work, because I have, I always, I mean, lately I'm working really a lot with the voice and especially with one's own voice and one, how one, um, perceives also hears one's own voice. Um, so for this, I have uh, created recently a lot of um, solitary um, settings. Um, one piece I did was um, exactly, you are actually alone reading a text and at the same time through headphones hearing your own voice, uh, mostly amplified and sometimes modified. Um, so um, it is your voice, but at the same time, it's not your voice and your voice starts playing with you. So you start speaking differently and then, you know, you cannot speak anymore because it, it comes with a little bit of delay and, you know, all the um, performativity or how you become, you know, that it's not uh, you perform the voice, but at the same time, the voice performs you as you speak. So um, this, at the same time, this doing and perceiving uh, has been very important. Uh, in another setting, I, it was a conversation with a pillow or let's say a machine, an artificial voice coming from a pillow. So you're speaking with the artificial voice, yet you are in some way, uh, there's a lot of reflectivity on your own voice. Uh, and a sense of artificial intimacy. Um, and in this piece, I feel like it is a little bit similar that you are still alone among yeah, with these two people. In this case, you are still addressing, yeah, it is still there is more of a sense of community indeed than all the pieces before or but still you're left a little bit to think for yourself how this sense of one-to-one um, -one communication relates to the community. Um, I mean, in all these pieces, I do think that um, it has been important for me indeed that you are, uh, that the audience would be always um, doing and perceiving at the same time. Um, that it will be their doing that will be the theater. Um, and that they would, I mean, maybe the difference is that in the previous pieces, you would have only responsibility for your own experience. You know, whatever you would do uh, with your own voice or with whatever you would say to the pillow, it would be at your discretion. Dis question <laughs> look like um, it would affect only your experience and nobody else's um, and the big difference in this piece is actually you do play, uh, carry a sense of responsibility for others experience because the way you pass on um, you think how people will receive it along the line because whatever you take away from it or you add to it will be passed on in a certain way along the line. Um, and I think um, just because we are in this moment and this, we are in this moment of COVID and in, in this place of isolation, um, uh, I, I, I thought it's okay that audience would carry also responsibility for each other's experience. Mm -hmm. well. Oh, that's beautiful as well. Um, like nurturing for each other. Um, I think you had mentioned um, that COVID brought out some of the best in people, right? Of people taking care of each other, community organizations coming together and um, really highlighting that in this piece, I think is, is a gorgeous way to, to talk about it. Um, I just thought of a question <laughs> when you were talking about the audience uh, being responsible for passing along. Um, is the final, are the final words uh, recorded or written down anywhere so that we know 
uh, if how accurate or if the message was changed or what happens at the end of the line, or does it just become part of the, you know, the experience is more important than the actual outcome? Because I think about um, like uh, Yoko Ono did some urn pieces, right? Where she would break them and everybody would take a piece and they were supposed to come back together and put the urn together but everyone wanted just to keep it for themselves, right? And so that that final product mm. never came together. I'm wondering, is there a final a final um, uh, writing that comes out of this or is it more just about that, those individual roles? It is about those individual roles, yes. <laughs> and it's also, I mean, this is also what um, we, uh, I thought a lot about it, but, uh, at some point, I wanted to make clear that this is not that game. It is not the telephone game. Um, uh, there's no, yeah, there's no outcome. There's no winning or losing or, you know, uh, seeing how much it got changed. Uh, you, you receive it in a certain way. You don't know how much it has changed already and you pass it on not knowing how much more it will change. Um, and I think all this is somehow left to your imagination in the end of um, what, it, because I mean, the, the letters themselves are also from 69 to 71. Uh, they're um, 50 years old actually now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's also interesting that you receive it in a transformed manner. Uh, and also that everybody in the line will receive it to a certain degree in a transformed manner. Um, but how exactly it is transformed, I thought it's not so interesting. So it's it's really putting trust in the person next to you too, right? And in, in, in participating in this collective action together. Um, that's lovely. Um, so I know we're going to open up for questions uh, pretty quickly here, but I, um, one more question. If I know this piece was commissioned specifically during the time of COVID, and that's a really difficult uh, task to be a performance artist uh, when you have to be socially distanced and you can't have big groups of people indoors. Um, and um, I was wondering if you could talk about that commission and like how you came to it and then of course how you feel about this work traveling to Cincinnati without you right <laughs> you are you are in Berlin right now so um and and how that kind of lets the piece live on um yes um I was asked to work with the uh, COVID measures as I was doing the piece but uh, maybe something that to mention is that I had not thought about masks uh, it was a time when it seemed uh, pretty certain that it is safe to be outdoors without masks uh, as long as you can keep a certain distance from each other. So um, while working on the piece, I had seen told that the participants would see each other's uh, lips, actually, and also each other's face. Um, and the regulation that everybody should wear a mask in public space uh, in Brussels came up only two, three weeks before the performance. Um, and there's something uh, interesting that is um, that you actually cannot even connect to the face uh, of the person before or after, but it's um, there's something in how it puts emphasis on the voice itself, uh, that in the end I tried to, um, yeah, I find uh, there's also something interesting with these masks that was not intended. Of, of course, it makes it more difficult to understand each other because we read each other's lips a lot when we are speaking. Um, uh, here in Cincinnati, actually, Drew was uh, suggesting uh, transparent masks at some point. You know, there are these uh, shield-like. Uh, we even tried them, um, 
but they also look like, I mean, then I thought uh, you will all look like aliens along that. So, you know, you will be like a very, very specific group of people coming from the dentist. <laughs> Uh, also, it was not comfortable to speak with, and uh, everybody hated it when they put it on. I was like, okay, they're not. Um, uh, yeah, so the mask was the biggest obstacle, I think. Uh, despite having told about the measures from the beginning, the mask was something that is always like, ah. Um, about the letters being passed on in Cincinnati, I, of course, uh, there's something uh, that is um, very difficult in the sense of I cannot see the space, I cannot give feedback, I cannot do certain fine tunings that I would like to do. Uh, but at the same time, um, um, but at the same time, of course, it makes sense because it's the letters of Sam and um he passed them on to me and to our creation team i pass it on to a group of performers in cincinnati um i don't know it's it's um it works with the idea that the letters are passed on uh over the distance and nobody has really authorship over them and I have to say the group of performers we worked with were I worked with was were very generous and super nice performers. I hope they enjoy it. They are enjoying what they are doing at the moment because it's also they do two performances per day. Uh, it is quite uh, an engagement that they said yet yes to. I'm very thankful for. Thank you so much. Um... Yeah, I'm gonna pass this on to Shawnee so she can get the questions here. I've not been looking at the chat, so. Yeah, um, that was a really wonderful conversation. We do have some, some questions. The first one I'm gonna start with, um, it actually goes along with what you were just saying, Beckham. Um, knowing that narrators are often unreliable, you know, they, you know they're obviously from their singular perspective. Um, is the truthfulness within Melville's notes important? And we, do we need to trust him for this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, trust is definitely uh, um, uh, an active effort. <laughs> And a, a, a suspension, a, a fate of leap. Uh, that in this case we do together. I uh, kind of coming off of that, you were talking about yeah. transformation, and um, it kind of got my mind going about the the power of transformation, um, mm -hmm. and you know the process um, that Melville went through and the process that the participants go through. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's something in this um, embodying uh, the letters and embodying the words. And of course, as you embody and you make it your own, you also change the content. It is a, there's this uh, collective way of working through this material um, that everybody Mm, it crosses all these bodies until it comes to you, like literally all these physical bodies and their voices. Um, so there is a way of that we are all together uh, working it out somehow, you know, what it means, what it um, means today. Um, and in that sense, of course, there is a, a um, it is not necessarily about the authenticity of the, of the letters themselves, but the authenticity of the pe uh, performance that you're receiving from the person before. Um, so the idea of truthfulness is maybe not so much anymore with the, text mm -hmm. no that, that but more with the voice <laughs> that makes a lot of sense yesterday um 
There was a lot of talk between uh, Lorena and Raquel about the spectator and the spectator's mm -hmm. role. And one of the commonalities that I'm seeing that we discussed yesterday and today is that there has been this transformation um, in the work around what the spectator is expected to do mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. behave mm -hmm. um, and how we begin to break those roles, particularly I think with performance art. Is this something that you feel like you have done consciously or has it been an evolution in your practice? Um, yeah, it has been a revolution. I mean, I have worked very often, I actually come from dance and choreography and I have worked um, um, often with the idea of scores. Um, so a score would be a score would be a list of instructions of, you know, you do this, 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 uh, but of course it's always open for interpretation. Uh, so anybody can, take that score and do out of it whatever they want. Um, and this sense of that the piece itself exists only as a potential, you know, it's just a rough list of instructions. It's a rough plan, uh, but how it is actually actualized uh, differs from performance to performance or that it differs depending on the interpreter. Um, is something I think that has been important for me uh, throughout my work. But it's only recently that um, I have put actually the audience into the position of the interpreter. You know, that I would give the score in the sense to the audience. So this is the text, for example, in this case, uh, pass it on. Um, It is not necessarily something that I want to continue doing, like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but I mean, there's something about audience participation that is definitely interesting that the audience is in some kind of a role. Uh, and the role is not is always in some kind of role and, and it doesn't have to be necessarily sitting in a dark tribune, keeping quiet, keeping sitting. I mean, this is also a very specific role. Um, so for sure, I'm going to challenge that role, but uh... yeah, I think that's interesting. In my role at the CAC, yeah. working with interpretation, you know, mm -hmm. my primary goal is accessibility, you know, and I want to make sure that everyone has that, mm -hmm. that buy-in to the experience and mm -hmm. the ability to reach it on their level, you know, their, their work on that level. And I, I find this really um, interesting personally, because, you know, I've been really attempting to have, for instance, art teachers begin to bring performance into the classroom. And one of the reasons they haven't done that in the past is because they feel like it's too hard for a lot of logistical reasons, but also because I feel like they, you know, they weren't taught that in school. So it's harder for them to even begin to enter into but I've found particularly um, in the programming that Drew has brought to the CAC and that I've been able to experience the artist, there, there is a, I feel a drive to, to open this up more and allow um, greater audiences to really benefit um, from the wonderful work you're doing. Um, so I, I mean, I can't wait, just listening to Emily talk about, um, I can't wait to take my turn um, listen, listen as well. Um, I do have um, another question from the audience. With your type of projects, where do you find your inspiration? Is it more solo development or do you work with a team? I know you talked about collaboration earlier, but is that a common element or do you, do you also do solo works? Um... Uh, I mean, this moment of inspiration, you never know. <laughs> this is something that you always know in uh, retrospect, I have a feeling. But um, what happened to me lately, I have been very often in residency in Japan. Um, and Japan is a country that has a very specific uh, relationship to loneliness, togetherness, um, the voice. Uh, there's a very specific relationship between formality and sensuality. Uh, and this 
and being in Japan and uh, experiencing this sense of alienation from what I have been used to so far in daily life, in arts, in communication, in, yeah, in everything. <laughs> Uh, and also being quite alone, because once you're there, you're really alone, a uh, sense of alienated loneliness <laughs> um, has been actually repeatedly very inspiring to me. So um, that's also where I find myself in the position of uh the one like this piece where it was about one's own voice where you would speak and hear your own voice at the same time um it came up when i was um when i was um sorry i got distracted the question um when i was in japan i went to a, a karaoke bar with friends and then i saw uh, it's not a bar actually it's like a hotel so you get the key at the entrance and then you go to one of these rooms. And in a lot of the rooms, people were alone doing karaoke. So it, it is not even that, you know. And apparently I asked about it. Apparently it's very common that people would go uh, for a karaoke session on their own uh, to practice the songs or you know so that's what i did also the day after that i went i booked a room and i did karaoke alone and there was quite a it was quite interesting you know because i hate karaoke otherwise but once you're alone you have more courage you have another relation your own voice becomes your partner you know the thing that you this uh, the thing that you observe as if it's a performance your own voice um also, the idea of companions, artificial companions, is very common in Japan. So, yeah, this this uh, this has happened to me repetitively. Actually, that uh, I was in a situation where I thought this is uh, uh, very interesting because my own voice becomes the performer, or my own pillow becomes the conversation partner, or you know. Yeah, I, I think. Um, I know I definitely have more courage singing and dancing in my own house. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, one of the things that struck me earlier when you were mm -hmm. talking about Sam not being able to talk about things, you know, and just relating the content of the letters, mm -hmm. there, there was just this tug at me, you know, and his desire to communicate and his desire to reach out and feel companionship in the letters but that he wasn't able to really do that and that mm -hmm. that sense of loss um mm -hmm. of of being able to be your full person even in a letter mm -hmm. um is a very lonely feeling and i and i just i'm coming back to that and i'm wondering if that's one of the reasons why it it drew you in mm -hmm. um, yeah, indeed. It, I mean, it was a mix of this, this loneliness, but at the same time, the energy, you know, the energy and motivation that he had. Um, I mean, in this piece, I have to say, it's also being in this Corona lockdown uh, felt for me. It's also you have exactly the same sense of alienation to your surrounding as if you would go to Japan or to the boon or somewhere else. Suddenly you were like at home. It was another place. Uh, and you had another, I had another sense of um, in, in regards to loneliness and togetherness. And in his letters, I really read this uh, relationship between loneliness and togetherness uh, very eloquently described. Well, this last question is a, a hard shift from what we were just talking about, but okay. a little lighter to end our day. Um, can you talk about the, the switch? And it's described here as a hard switch from molecular mm -hmm. biology and genetics to the arts. <laughs> and wondering if that background um, influences your, proce your process and practice. I mean, I think the way um, it's a very abstract influence. I, I think the way it influences uh, my practice is this, um, 
um, how how it blurs a bit the border between inside and outside, between natural and not natural, um, and also the borders between uh, active and passive or object and subject, you know, that it's like, uh, and I mean, in that sense, it somehow does inspire me and like the virus, you know, that it's, Mm, that it transgresses borders and that it puts you in um, where the idea of act between active and passive is not anymore what it used to be. Um, and other than this, uh, I think the arts and the science are not that far from each other in terms of their daily practice. I mean, in the science, you would sit in the laboratory for a long time, trying out the same things, trying a little bit different, repeating because you made a mistake. And, um, and I think the laboratory is very similar to the studio yeah, in that we've, sense. <laughs> we've even done lessons on the you know similarities between the scientific and design methods. and. Mm -hmm. you know, what each can learn from each other, which is really nice. Um, so I, I want to thank first uh, Begum and Emily for um, just giving us a really wonderful conversation today and a lot to think about. Um, and to thank all of you for spending your hour with us and, and just getting to know these two individuals um, a little bit more, uh, that shared companionship we were talking about. Um, we do have um, openings today um, for Begum's um, performance at seven o'clock. So there are openings for that at Sawyer Point and then continually through Sunday. So check out the CAC website, the Facebook events page. Um, also check out our social media. Um, Raquel Andre, our guest yesterday has some prompts there for her um, performance on Sunday. Um, and as well as the, the other great performances we have going on through TTT. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, and I hope you all have a, a great day. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.